Hello, my name is Dr. Ambridge and I'm a chiropractic neurologist and a functional endocrinologist and I want to introduce a presentation by a dear friend, Dr. Ari Bojani. He'll be speaking regarding the autoimmune uh, system and why early detection of autoimmune disease is really important. I hope you enjoy the presentation. He's a colleague that has, uh, is proclaimed and speaks globally around the world and you'll see him in most summits and symposia regarding wellness and uh, immune responses. So enjoy your presentation and uh, have a great day. Hospitality. And I understand how interested you guys are. So during this you know, rainy evening, you prefer to come and listen to my lecture. It's my honor that you know, to lecture to you guys. So I'm going to share with you actually 50 years of experience. About 50 years ago, uh, almost the last year of my bachelor degree, I went to a professor of immunology. I said I want to work in the labor immunology laboratory. So I stayed there almost for 50 years. So I'm meaning in the field, in the laboratory. So, uh, so we, I'm going to talk about autoimmune diseases. Why does early detection matters? Uh, and then, what is autoimmunity? Is this natural to have autoimmune or autoimmune disease? That's absolutely no. One of the first lessons that I learned in immunology classroom was that the body has the capacity to differentiate between self versus non-self or not self. That's, you know, we have all these sort of soldiers in the body called the immune system. So, the, so with that definition, meaning that our immune system should react to only foreign material, but should not react to our own body structure. So why then we have autoimmune diseases? 10% of the population, 53% America autoimmune disease or associated disorders. So uh, hopefully by end of the talk, you'll, you'll, you'll understand why the immune system is going to, take, to make mistakes and attack its own tissue, okay? So now, uh, in about almost a uh, couple of weeks, I'll be going to Leipzig in Germany, International Congress of Autoimmunity. And the organizer of the meeting always talks about the mosaic of autoimmunity. And here I put that mosaic together uh, in the form of kind of pyramid. So what do we have in this in here? This is one of the most important slides. If you if you in the future would like to have a copy of that, ask Dr. Ambridge will give that to you guys because I'm giving a copy of my presentation to him. This is the most important slides, and then there is a, a reverse slide at the end of my talk. So when I get to the V, meaning it's end of my talk, but you'll see that slide actually is how to fix our immunity. Okay, so what do we have in here? First of all, let's talk about this. Genetic makeup, yes, extremely important. But in addition to genes, look how many factors can affect autoimmune diseases or causing induction of autoimmune diseases. Vaccine components, what do we have in vaccines? We have the infectious agents, we have toxic chemicals, and we have some food antigens, all three. These are the three major uh, components which may cause autoimmunity. I'll talk about that. But we have all those in the vaccines. Again, I'm not against vaccines. Okay? Vaccines are helping us significantly, but to do it at the right time. Not when a child is born the first day in the hospital and you give that child hepatitis B. And so, in fact, last year I spoke here, my daughter was pregnant 
for the child that he was born and we named, we named him Plague. So, <laughs> and Plague was not immunized in the hospital. Only he will be immunized when really he has to. When he is two or three years old, when the immune system is mature enough, which can handle all of that. So hormonal factors playing a role. Some individuals naturally have low IgA. Their, their immune system is not making enough IgA. Uh, adjuvants, what are adjuvants? Silicone, such as silicone breast implants. That, these are kind of oils in, in general altogether. We call them, you know, uh, adjuvant, enhancers of the immune reaction. Then look at the infections in general, whether it's influenza, hepatitis, EBV, CMV, mycoplasma, and there are many, many more. So out of the three factors responsible for induction of our immunities, infections are right here. And then, don't forget now, the chemicals. The chemicals are extremely also important. For some reason, many clinicians do accept that medication can cause autoimmune disease. For example, drug-induced lupus, okay, right? Then they remove the medication, hopefully, or immune, in this case lupus, reverses to the normal. So they accept that drugs can induce autoimmunity, but drugs are chemicals, right? So chemicals can induce autoimmunity, so plastic bisphenol A is becoming extremely important. There is so much information in the literature about this. Heavy metals. You will see some information about that. Aluminum, which is part of the vaccines also now. They removed mercury, but they added aluminum. Uh, pesticides, food additives, many others. So all these chemicals, unfortunately, there are, you know, there are about 100,000 new chemicals that were introduced after 1940. You know, to our environment, and therefore, don't be surprised why we have more autoimmunities. So, infection, chemicals, all of that, and again, ladies, cosmetics also are responsible for some autoimmune diseases. I'm not talking about organic cosmetics, I'm talking about chemically made cosmetics. Uh, and then, food. Gluten, casein, many other foods that are responsible. All of these usually cause gut dysbiosis and then opening of gut barriers, which is the gateway to autoimmunity. So that's how gene plus three environmental factors affect our integrity of gut microbiota, gut microbiome, and then the end result is going to be our immunity. Okay, our immunity is unfortunately many years of suffering. My own mother suffered from osteoarthritis at age 40 after having oral infection with uh, Porphyromonas gingivalis, now we know that releases a toxin, the toxin goes into the body, the body is attack, attacked, it, and then uh, the end result is going to be our immune system going to attack the joint, and after a few years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, full-blown autoimmune disease. And so at age 40, we started having it, at age 50, we could see that, we, you know, we could observe, and then she suffered up to age 87, two total knee replacements. That's why I got into this field, you know, I, I, you know my research and all of that in relation to all the So, 
So means decades of suffering. Or immunity. What is that? V. That's the last slide that I'm going to you know, talk about this, but uh, that's my last name, Wojdani. Okay. <laughs> so now, let me share with you something very, very important. This article came out in 2014 by one of our friends who works a neurologist at UCLA, which is going to have his um, grand round in a few days in uh, Cleveland Clinic, part of the functional medicine. Exactly about what you see in here. What is, what is the title? Please read it. What is the title? Have you ever seen reversal? Reversal of what? Alzheimer's. So that's why, you know, doctors like uh, Ambridge doing functional neurology because there is hope. So what Dr. Bredesen did, um, he took 10 patients who had full glow, not full glow, at the beginning of Alzheimer's. All of them had the story that my mother had Alzheimer's. She died, she died at 85, 87, 90, 95, and then I don't want to live like that. That was really the request. So when they went to classical neurologists at age 62, 63, 64, when they had a little bit of dementia, he or she told them that, sorry, there is nothing we can do for you. There is nothing we can do for you. You are going to die like your own mother because this is all in the gene. This is all about genetics. So they went to Dr. Bredesen and he took only 10 of them. He put them on the following program, okay? This is the program. Uh, Elimination of, of all simple carbohydrates. Elimination of gluten from the diet. Because we know the mechanism of gluten cross react with brain cells. Elimination of processed food. You take, you know, you get rid of all those uh, uh, food colorings and all of those additives. Increase non farm fish and vegetables. More fish, healthy fish and vegetables because fish oil is good for the brain. Good sleep. That's melatonin for good sleep. Very important. Uh, that's vitamin B12, right? Yes. Methylcobalamin. That's good for also brain cells. Vitamin D, don't forget that. I'll show you later the mechanism, why we need it. It's not just for the bone density and all of that. We don't take vitamin D plus calcium just for osteoporosis. You take vitamin D for nervous and immune function. Fish oil, CoQ10, exercise. Don't forget the exercise. Very important. Yoga. And then the last part is minimum three hours between dinner and, uh, and bedtime, 12 hours between dinner and breakfast. Why is that? Because you want to digest the food properly. So this is really just a very simple program that he did. Nine out of 10 reversed, and some of them went back to work. The tenth one, if you read the article by Dr. Bredesen, because she was progressed. What is the message in here? That if we detect at early stage, we can do something about it. So ladies and gentlemen, when you have any problem, please take care of it at early stage. Sometimes it will be too late if you go to see your functional medicine doctor. So I just wanted in the beginning to share that with you because I know the first two, three minutes you are going to remember the best. <laughs>
Okay, now, 53 million Americans, we talked about that, right? Uh, you know, unfortunately, we have more autoimmune disease in females than in males. Sometimes ratio of 18 to one, sometimes three to one, sometimes five to one. So that's the picture. And guess whose hand is that? My mother. You see the degree of malformation. So autoimmunity can affect every single part of our body. There is no a part of the body that is not going to be attacked by the immune system. If the, if the environmental triggers are in that place. The autoimmune epidemics, fantastic book, if you, would, you guys would like to read, but look what is the message. Uh, in the past decade, more than 15 top medical journals have reported that in industrialized countries around the world, the increasing incidences of many autoimmune and neuroimmune disorders are reaching epidemic proportion. And then, National Institutes of Health did twin study. If one twin had autoimmune disease, the second one, only 30% had a chance to get autoimmune disease. 70% did not get autoimmune disease, etc. So therefore, conclusion was genes are one third, the other two third are environmental triggers or environmental factors. And that's really my specialty, to work on environmental triggers as the cause of autoimmunity. Because genes, there's not a lot we can do about it, right? But Environmental triggers, we can fix them and remove them from the body. So now let's talk about three most important cells in our body. What do you think? If I'll ask the man. Okay. <laughs> or the ladies. Here. Egg or sperm, right? The next, neurons, very important, but I want you to remember the third one, okay? This is the third one. It's called regulatory T cells. It regulates the immune system. Maybe I'm blinded by being an immunologist, but I believe that's the third most important cell in our body. Okay. What is this? What is the message of this article? <laughs> Just published about two weeks ago in Science. How does the immune system tolerate food? So a child is born, doesn't have any immune system, right? That's why I'm against vaccination the first day, because that's the time that good bacteria from the mother, good factors from breast milk, um, all of that, or bacteria from vag vaginal tissue, it's all of that is healthy to get into the body and will start activating the immune system in order to have that regulatory T cells in the gut and in the blood. Okay. So, that's how the body is going to learn in the future not to react to any food and not to react to friendly bacteria in our gut. We call that immune tolerance mechanism. So that's why. How does the immune system tolerate food? Because intestinal T cell balance the immune response to microbes and food. The T-Rex cell. And then dietary antigen limit mucosal immunity by inducing regular T cell in small intestine. And then there is the next picture that I drew this, okay? So we have four types of regular, we have regular T cells in four parts of our body. One is in the colon, okay? 
The reason you see these foxes in here, that's the name of the gene in that cell called FOXP3. So just to remember that, I put just a picture of a fox. Make it a little bit funny. So we have that in colon. We have T-Rex cells in the small intestine. We have that in the blood and in our tissue. And we have that also in the thymus gland. So our white blood cells manufactured in the bone marrow migrate to the thymus to get their education and then from thymus they migrate to different in the blood and tissues where they are going to protect us in the future against any invasion. So these are the four types of T-Rex cells which are important in maintaining homeostasis in our body and preventing autoimmune disease. And that's why regulating the T-Rex cells, which most functional immunologists are doing, um, that's the key to preventing and treating autoimmune diseases. So this is again about oral tolerance, that that cell maintaining oral tolerance and maintaining also central tolerance. And this is how cells migrate from bone marrow, they go to the thymus, they get their education. In the thymus, we have a computer within. Any cells have receptors for our tissue get destroyed. That's why that when I said that our immune system learns from the first day to differentiate between cell versus not cell, this is it. But cells which are supposed to kill bacteria, viruses, parasites, should survive, migrate into the blood and tissues where they are going to protect us for the rest of our life. That's the ideal situation. Any breakdown in this process can result in our immunity. And T-Rex cells are playing a role in all of that. So if we'll summarize all of this part, that we are exposed to toxic chemicals. I call that exposome. The toxic chemicals, or even toxic from infectious agents, or combination of chemicals plus food that we consume, which is that's a reality because pesticides plus food proteins combine with each other, and then we consume them. So, that is going to change our microbiome. The same good bacteria our mothers gave us, now it's going to be affected by environmental triggers and change their integrity. So genome, proteome, metabolome, immunome, and then finally, finally all immune. So these are all new words that using in the literature. So now, in relation to commensal bacteria, these are all the function of commensal bacteria. Good bacteria, if you have balanced bacteria, good bacteria, you are not going, going to have problem with your leaky gut, and you are not going to have autoimmune disease. So one of the root causes of autoimmunity is change in the gut microbiota and induction of leaky gut syndrome, which is the gateway to autoimmunity. That's why your functional uh, medicine doctor, functional neurologist may give you probiotics in addition to fish oil and many others. So here, the, again, one more time, the three environmental triggers, toxic chemicals, infections, dietary proteins can change it. Gut microbiota cause eubiosis, which is the balance, is the ideal. But unfortunately, when we have this one or all three factors causes dysbiosis, systemic inflammation, asthma, atopic dermatitis, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, 
uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and many others. So by fixing the gut microbiome, we can prevent many autoimmune diseases. In fact, in this article uh, showing that uh, if you have bad bacteria, bacteria releases toxin, the toxin can go to the brain and cause depression. So that's what they're exactly telling us. So major, this is the connection between gut and our brain. Sometimes I call this first brain, and this is the second brain. And mechanism, how infection can activate the type of cell in our body now called T helper 17. That's a pathogenic T cell, exactly opposite to T rex cell, where this cell become activated, releasing all kinds of mediators and go to the joint, and we call that the kiss of death to the joints. That's exactly what happened in my mother's joints. So he, she had to have total knee replacement. But then I didn't know it. The T helper 17 just discovered about eight to 10 years ago. That was 50 years ago. And, and also, don't forget also, the same T helper 17 can go to the nervous system and cause damage to the neuron, resulting in multiple sclerosis and, and other neuroimmune disorders. So if we look at some of these factors, by damaging the barriers of the gut, this is the you know, causing leaky gut, intestinal barrier dysfunction, food allergy, immune system abnormalities, or immunity. It's one after another will follow. And so I came up with this test with Dr. Ambridge using it a lot, how to assess the integrity of the gut by looking at these lipopolysaccharides, toxins produced by the bacteria, when the balance between good versus bacteria, the balance between good versus bad bacteria is in, a fa is in, a, in a favor of bad bacteria. Bad bacteria releasing the toxins, and then we make antibody, so that indicates permeability or dysbiosis. Causing damage to the tissue, then we make antibody against that, and causing damage to the tight junctions, and therefore our gut barriers, we do not have protection, and undigested dietary components can get to the uh, submucosa and then into the blood, which causing inflammation in the blood, inflammation in the blood uh, uh, can result in autoimmunity. So one more time there are genes, of course, right there, genetic components, plus three environmental factors. Please, don't forget that. Are responsible for induction of autoimmunities. By removing the triggers such as dietary components, infection, and toxic chemicals, we can reverse the course of autoimmunities. Stop or reverse the course of autoimmunities. That's why you need to do some lab tests in order to find which triggers are responsible. Uh, for certain autoimmune diseases in that specific individual. So these are some of the statistics. So if we add up some of these, almost every single American is suffering from some kind of immune disorder. Number of chemicals introduced, already talked about that. And unfortunately, some of the bad habits we have in the every day, and without thinking about we are doing it, that by itself is a major cause of induction of autoimmunities. Think about it, okay? So this is, what is wrong with this? That's first of all, that uh, apple pie is uh, gluten-free. But if it's, if it's cooked in aluminum, do you think it's right to eat that? Believe me, I, you know, first I bought it without thinking. 
$14 each, two of them. <laughs> I took it home and then went into trash when I found out, wow. Well, you don't think, right? Or, or what is this? How did they cook that? <coughs> Aluminum. Or some of those in your offices, you have that coffee, what do you call that? Espresso, espresso that you push and then you get a cup of coffee. What is that material made from? Right? Think about it. I didn't think about it when I spent $28 on those five. <laughs> <laughs> But we have to think. Okay. Do you know what is the pH of some of these drinks? You can see that right there, 2.2. What is the pH, acidity, of vinegar you think? It's three. This is lower than, so, how much vinegar can you drink in one day? Huh? How much coke you can drink? Now, okay, but some people drink the whole bottle, right? And guess what that is doing to your structure of the gut. So, Dr. Ambridge, please ask your patients whether or not drink some of this stuff without mentioning any names. <laughs> because that's the pH, right? So, really healthy water, clean water is the best, most important to have. Like, like what we serve right now. Yeah. Right now, the clean water we have today. Okay, so these are, these are really some of the examples. You know, it's uh, painful when you work in a laboratory, and I'm hands-on, I love to work in the laboratory. Sometimes I do this kind of experiments, right? But you have to be aware. Okay, what information do we have in here? The scientists, regarding the obesity. Yeah, I know everybody's talking about obesity all of that. But this article actually is talking about, look at that word. This is the environmental obesogenes. So several articles in there are telling us that calorie in, calorie out is not enough if you don't remove the toxic chemicals from your body from, or from the body of your patients. That's why some people diet after diet after diet, they don't lose weight because some of these 100,000 chemicals in our environment. That's why they call those obesogenes. So to just show you what happened in here that uh, organotin is very toxic chemicals. They use it for painting and all of that. Uh, if we take, these are, normal adipo or adipocytes, and we add chemicals to that, they become fat cells and large fat cells. Very simple, okay? Now, another experiment, yeah, mes mesenchymal cells are stem cells. Okay? We take those stem cells, add growth factor to them, that's what they do these days, by the way, to grow stem cells. And so they, one of them becomes bone, the other one becomes cartilage, muscle, heart, and fat cell. But if we treat an animal, in this case mice or rats, uh, with some toxic chemicals, and take the same stem cells from their body, majority of them become fat cells. And so therefore that's indication that chemicals are changing our metabolism, therefore we are going to you know, have more fat cells rather than having, for example, muscle or, or uh, heart, heart cells or whatever. Okay, now endocrine disrupting organic compounds are potent inducer of adipogenesis and chemicals that mess with hormonal pathways make the human body susceptible to obesity. That's really the message right there. So endocrine disruptors actually competing with our hormones. And I think I put some slides in here. Now, there's a, there are about 20 slides from the same uh, 
series, but I put only one or two slides. A hard nut to crack, reducing chemical migration in food contact material. What are, this is done by National Institute of Environmental Health. For example, if you put just a bread, a sandwich with aluminum, you put it in the refrigerator, certain amount of that aluminum get into the bread without us knowing at all, without observing it. So we, till now, we thought you have to cook with aluminum in order aluminum to get into food. Now they're saying, no, it's enough just to have a contact. The molecules can migrate. That's, that's really the message in here. Okay, so here are some of the examples. So recycle paperboard may be contaminated with chemicals from papers not originally intended for food contact uses. Even milk, you know, that there's a layer of chemicals in those, you know, so therefore some of that goes into the Again, please be aware and try to reduce these as much as possible. <coughs> Toxicology of autoimmune, what does that mean? I'm not going into any details. What is, what is the meaning of toxicology? Tox toxicology of autoimmune meaning chemical, toxic chemicals causing autoimmune disease, right? That's why I, another set of tests that when chemicals get into our body, that 80% of it goes to the blood, to the kidney, and then to the urine. But unfortunately, 20%, again, depends on our genetic makeup, 20% of that get metabolized and bind to our tissue. And that's why we have to measure that. If our measure bisphenol A in the urine of all of you, in 96% will find bisphenol A, which is the plastic material, because we are drinking in plastic material every day. But if bisphenol A binds to our tissue, that's the mechanism of induction of autoimmune disease. And that's why I developed this test to measure antibody against those chemicals bound to human tissue. It's part of our array 11. And then I did some research, my own research, published in a journal called uh, Applied Journal of Applied Toxicology. Took several hundred healthy subjects and looked for those antibodies. Found that in about 15 to 20 percent of healthy subjects. But these are the individuals, if they will not do something about it, in the future they will develop autoimmune disease. They are healthy today, but not 10 years from now. So this, you know, that's the structure. If, from a biochemical point of view, if I will take thyroid hormone structure, put it side by side with this, this phenolate exactly looks identical. So that's why this phenolate can interfere with thyroid function. So that's the percentage you see that at very high levels of antibodies, the red, 15% against this phenolate. Just put a few slides for you in here because each one of those are a couple hours talk. So, to understand endocrine disruptors, how do they work? Bisphenol A, for example, if this is a cell, right? It has a receptor, some kind of antenna-like material. Hormone binds to the cell and, and generate like electricity, some kind of uh, activity. And that activity goes into, triggers function in our different part of the body. That's the function of hormones, bind to the receptors and then we function because of that. 
Now, the next slide. What if the chemical looks like the hormone? Look at the shape of the hormone versus the shape of bisphenol A, for example, or mercury. Now, the chemical binds to the receptor, and the hormone cannot bind, weak signal goes through, and then cell function interference. So interference with cell function due to endocrine disruptors. In some cases, the, the hormone, actually the chemicals, looks like half of the hormone, and then binds to the receptor and blocks the activity of the hormone. So I told Dr. Ambridge, this year I have much better slides than last year, right? So, simple to understand. These are how the endocrine uh, disruptors and chemicals can interfere with our body functionality. So we have to minimize these chemicals as much as possible. And then look at the title. How a chemical element elicits complex immunopathology. Then the next sentence is lessons from mercury induced autoimmunity. This is no question in here that whether mercury can cause autoimmunity. How, what can we learn from mercury inducing autoimmunity? And then they give us the mechanism that mercury can penetrate our cell membrane, goes into the nucleus, bind to the nuclear material, our genetic material, the cell die, releasing that, and then we make antibody against our own nuclear material, our own cellular material. That's the mechanism of autoimmunity. Mercury inducing autoimmunity. And so chemical exposure, of course genetic factors are important, the breakdown in the barriers, uh, the parent compounds or metabolites can cause oxidative stress, formation of chemicals plus our own tissue, uh, activation of our immune system cells, Reacting against that, the results could be inflammation and autoimmune reactivities. This is a very good summary of how environmental triggers, especially chemicals, can induce inflammation and autoimmunities. Well, look just at the title one more time in here, another article. Uh, by the way, you see that my presentation is uh, uh, evidence-based. It's not just theories. I'm showing you the argument. So no one will have any doubts about the presentation. So pesticides report bound xenobiotic residues in food commodities of plants and animal origin. What does that mean? What does that mean? Okay, here. This is the summary right here. Meaning that chemicals from water, from uh, agricultural soil, and then the meat, crops, the dairy, and all of that, we end up in our body. For example, you eat steak, which has many pesticides. The pesticides get into our body, we metabolize them, and metabolites bind to our own tissue, we call that the body burden of toxic chemicals. That's exactly what they showed us in that article. I'd like to read an article and then simplify it.